I want to welcome you all to this presentation this evening. I do have a disclosure to begin with, and that is that the presentation is sponsored by Align Technology, and I thank them for their generosity and support for providing an honorarium for me to present this material to you today. So as you kind of peruse this slide and my history for the past couple of decades, what I really wanna share with you is that I'm likely not much different than any of you that are on this call tonight. I am a full-time practicing clinical restorative dental hygienist, um, but at the end of the day, I am trying to get my patients to a new level of health that not only brings them to a, a better level in the moment, but also something that can be maintained and sustained for the remainder of their lifetime. What's kind of cool about my job is that being a restorative dental hygienist in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, is that for the past couple of decades, I've had the ability to treat patients periodontally, uh, through orthodontic therapy, and also restorative therapy. And seeing all of those pieces kind of come together I've been able to have several aha moments of how I can use those different facets of dentistry to really provide my patients with a positive oral health outcome. So I do thank you if you are, you know, on the West Coast, I realize this is kind of you're rushing into your evening or the end of your day. And for those of us that are on the East Coast with me, that this is how you're probably winding your evening down tonight. So what do we know about dentistry? Whether you've been in it for a year or a couple of decades like myself, we know that it is complex and I certainly hope that this is not what your clinical days looked like today. Um, and it's tough, you know, from very periodontally complex patients to, you know, the types of information and charting that we have, the types of images that we can collect to be able to educate and engage our patients to bring them to a different level of health. So hopefully you don't see this type of scenario every day in your practice, but it also enlighten, enlightens us to think about the way we treat our patients or our clients so that they never get to this level of destruction. So it brings about this question of, is our current model of dental hygiene working? The latest statistics, although they're pretty aged now, considering that they are from 2012, are provided by the Center for Disease Control. And what those statistics tell us is that almost half of the American population has periodontal or periodontitis. So those numbers don't include gingivitis. And astronomically, that number rises to over 70% once we hit the age of 65 and greater. Now, when we also take a look at that oral systemic link that we know so much about now, the numbers are also quite frightening. So I'll start off with some of these Canadian stats, and, and these are quite relative or you know fairly up to date. But in Canada, every seven minutes, someone dies from heart disease or stroke, and that adds up to 206 people a day that uh, are passing away from that condition. In the United States, the numbers look far worse. Now, mind you, your population is much greater than what we have um, here north of the border, but in the U.S., someone has a heart attack every 40 seconds, and each minute, more than one person dies from a heart disease-related event. Every four minutes, someone dies from a stroke. So this messaging and you know the way we are treating our patients currently needs a second thought in terms of these types of numbers that we're seeing, not only with the existence or prevalence of periodontal disease, but that relationship to the whole body. We do have something that unifies us more uh, in terms of staging and grading periodontitis between uh, Canada and the US. 
And this is, this is our new uh, grading system that is the update to the previous system from 1999. What this new revised structure addresses is the complexity of periodontal disease and the need to consider all facets of client health in order to assess, diagnose, communicate, and then treat oral conditions more accurately. So it is something that I have just started to implement in my practice, and it is quite a transition when you've been used to doing something for 20 years. But what I found most interesting is that we really don't talk about or even look at or consider occlusion until we're having patients reach stage four. And at that point, we're really looking at secondary occlusal trauma, meaning that we're going to find things such as tooth mobility because of the presence of existing bone loss. It doesn't really speak to primary occlusal trauma. And obviously, we can appreciate that once we get into these later stages, that the rehabilitation becomes that much more complex, that much more expensive, and most importantly, that much more unpredictable as well. So if we think of these patients and this grade of periodontal disease and the amounts of bone loss that they would have, you know, what kind of chance do they have with these very complex rehabilitations that we perhaps could be planning at this point. So it makes me think about, you know, the statistics that we see about periodontal disease, that all important messaging of the oral systemic link, the love perhaps that I've grown um, with regards to teeth being in their proper position and having a stable occlusion, and then all of this new technology that available to us to be able to educate and engage and inspire our patients to take better care of themselves orally. So I'm going to introduce to you some of that new technology. Um, the images that you see tonight are those taken from an iTero Element digital scanner. It is the scanner that I have been using in my practice for the last eight years that I'm very familiar with and very comfortable with. But a lot of these tools are very common to all of the scanners that we have available on the market today. So the first tool that we're going to explore this evening is likened to a bite force distribution. You may have also heard it being called occlusal mapping or in this case, uh, the terminology for this particular visual is an occlusogram. It's most common on all intraoral digital scanners. And what it does is it provides information on essentially how pressure is distri distributed amongst all of the teeth and the arch as a whole. It provides a pathway for us to discuss the consequences of having a malocclusion. It readily identifies areas of concern with the science of a bad bite, and most importantly, drives that important education and client comprehension for the proposed treatment and prevention plan. This type of bite force distribution map or an occlusogram can be generated very quickly. So all of the scanners are designed now to be able to capture a full arch or both arches as well as the occlusal relationship within a few mere minutes and then this type of image can definitely be brought up quite quickly for us to be able to utilize chair side. When we think of you know looking at a static bite it does have some limitations. One we don't have timing so we don't really know which teeth touch first. That means that we don't get to see if there is something called a premature contact. So does one tooth kind of touch first and perhaps take more pressure than any other tooth as the other teeth come together? It won't allow us to see interferences or functional shifts, lateral excursions. So what do the teeth actually look like when we have 
a piece of food in between them and they get to be uh, worked. And on top of that, we have 20 uh, occlusion philosophies that our doctors study and adopt uh, within our practices every day. However, it doesn't take rocket science to appreciate that we don't always have to have something in motion to still derive great value from it. I think we can ultimately, you know, take a look at this parked car with a flat tire and appreciate that it's going to have some issues once we put it into motion. We're not going to be getting peak performance. So in that same way, we can use that bite force distribution or the occlusogram to be able to predict what type of issues we might see when that system is in function. The second tool we're going to take a look at this evening that I feel is so relevant to this new dental hygiene um, method, methodology of really um, integrating the technology and maximizing it within the hygiene chair is the, the concept of ongoing patient monitoring. So you may have heard ter terms used such as oral health monitoring scan, uh, time lapse, uh, preventive intervention scan, and possibly timeline. But what these scans allow us to do is to overlay two scans from two different periods of time and use some type of color grading where we can focus in on an area and be able to measure changes in tooth wear, soft tissue changes, and tooth movement. We can see some of these changes in as little as five one hundredths of a millimeter. That's the ultimate in prevention that we can offer our patients. So we're able to detect things earlier and also intervene more quickly. It also helps us, especially when patients can see, and with all of these applications, you know, our patients get to look at the screen, hear our explanations, and then they can even touch the screen, move their models around. So there's this visual, audio, and kinetic um, connection to, you know, what they're seeing on the screen. So it really helps to drive client acceptance of the preventive and restorative treatment that we're suggesting for them. Now, I know you're all looking at this picture and you're thinking, boy, would we ever love to have Steve Buscemi in our practice and do something about those teeth. So um, when we take a look at malocclusion on the whole, when and this whole new periodontal grading system that we're looking at, Traumatic occlusal forces and their role in the initiation and progression of periodontitis actually remains one of the most controversial and contentious subjects in the field of periodontology. So when this new system was put together by, I believe, about 170 dentists that congregated, I, most of them periodontists, there were moments where, you know, arguments and it got pretty heated, apparently even some fists started to fly because there was such um, contention over what role having a bad bite plays in the ongoing destruction or interferences with, you know, maintaining healthy bone levels. So what they did was they referenced 93 articles that were reviewed on the effects of occlusal trauma on the initiation and progression of periodontitis. And what they concluded from that, from those articles, that without plaque-induced inflammation, occlusal trauma does not cause irreversible bone loss or loss of connective tissue attachment. So therefore, it wasn't a causative agent of periodontitis. Yet, I think it's still very important for us to see, and we'll, we'll see in some of the slides coming um, forward, how Perhaps it doesn't play a role again once we get into that secondary occlusal trauma, but very much important for us to recognize and beneficial for the, the patients from a periodontal standpoint if we intervene early. And I know most of us did not go through the day today without having to deal with one of these issues that are 
um, derived from having a malocclusion. So whether it be abstractions or non carious class 5 lesions, premature wearing of the enamel, or some form of receding gums. And what's the commonality between all of these conditions? It's the sensitivity issue. So we're always trying to find, you know, whether it be immediate, short-term, and hopefully some long-term solutions so that we can eradicate the sensitivity and minimize the effects of, of these types of lesions that we, we see today. So I thought that we'll take a look at these three uh, very particular and common dental conditions and um, see what we can do from an occlusal perspective to find some resolution for the sensitivity. So let's start with abfractions. We first started to hear about abfractions in the late 1970s when excessive occlusal loading was proposed to be the cause of cervical stress that resulted in non-carious uh, class 5 lesions. However, despite the positive association of the size of these class 5 lesions and the extent of occlusal wear could not be correlated, they kind of abandoned this theory of excessive occlusal loading being the sole perpetrator of these types of lesions. So where we are today in terms of an accepted theoretic concept is this biocorrosion theory. So the formation of a class five lesion at this point in time is a threefold process. It involves the abrasivity, so the RDA factor or the RDA number of the toothpaste that our patients are using. Obviously more important to consider if we do have root surfaces that are exposed. That combined with improper toothbrushing technique, erosion from uh, acid in the, the diet and or the body, so acid either coming in through the mouth or up from the gut, and then of course, bite stress. And we can't really default bite stress. This was a study done by Selma Jakupovich and what she found or what she was able to measure are all of the components of the bite stresses that an individual tooth can take. And let's take a look at some of these numbers because it's quite fascinating. So at the cusp tip, a tooth can absorb up to 150 pounds per square inch. When we move down into the periodontal ligament, that number jumps to 450 pounds per square inch. The lateral intrusive force at the alveolar crestal bone is 1,500 pounds per square inch. So that's equivalent to um, being stepped on by a stiletto heel. So we can all appreciate that would not feel pretty good. So think of that interdental bone right in the area where the enamel starts to transition into cementum and the type of forces that are being applied there especially when it's in that lateral motion versus uh, a straight on vertical motion. And then that very thin supercrestal subsurface enamel, just as it begins to transition into root surface, can absorb up to 750 pounds per square inch. So it's no wonder that we get these lesions that will happen um, at that CEJ area. Now, if we look at all these numbers, that's a lot of impact that a tooth can take on a daily basis. But let's consider this. If that patient is grinding or clenching their teeth, all of those numbers can increase two to four times. So those numbers become that much more significant for us. So in a series of studies that investigated the association between occlusal discrepancies and the progression of periodontitis, they found that teeth with occlusal discrepancies had significantly deeper initial probing depth, more mobility, and a poorer prognosis than those teeth without occlusal discrepancies. So the way teeth come together is important for us to consider. And one of the ways that we can analyze that occlusal gram or that bite force map is to start to appreciate the difference between having markings on a working versus a non-working cusp. 
So ideally, when we look at tooth contacts in a static position, the heavier load or intensity should be distributed by the areas designated by the green lines pointed to by the arrow. This presents itself clinically when we have an ideal curve of Wilson, meaning that the posterior teeth are only tipped lingually so much as to create a linear discrepancy of one millimeter between the buccal and lingual cusps of the posterior teeth. Ideally, we don't want to have excessive forces displayed on what we call non-working cusps that I've identified here by the red zones in the diagram. In the literature, more recent cross-sectional epidemiologic studies revealed that non-working side contacts were actually associated with deeper probing depth, bone loss, and more clinical attachment loss compared to dentitions without non-working contacts. So the plot thickens here. So to help you identify what this would look like in a real life scenario with those kind of two tools that we discussed, um, here's a patient that presented. Uh, initially, we did this first scan in January of 2018. And on August 22nd, she came into our practice describing severe sensitivity, severe pain uh, on the upper and lower left-hand side. So we did this, um, originally, thankfully, we had this occlusal mapping. That particular day, we decided to take another scan. And what we can identify is by those red arrows, you can see that there are considerable markings placed on what would be a non-working cusp. So the buccal incline of the maxillary posterior teeth and then the um, buccal surfaces of the mandibular posterior teeth. With this particular occlusal mapping, where we see red would mean that that is where we have the highest intensity of impact. So the teeth are in uh, maximum intercuspation, there is no separation of the teeth, and then it scales down to these lighter contacts as we go into those blue zones. So the areas that this patient reported as being very sensitive are those areas where we can see those heavier markings and in the orangey kind of light red areas. So we were able to take those two scans and overlay them. And what we were able to see is the formation of a non-carious class 5 lesion. So that's a very short amount of time to see that type of significant change in the enamel tooth structure. So for my Canadian friends on the call tonight, that we can see that on tooth number 35. And for my American colleagues, that's tooth number 20. And we're able to do this because in our practice, we implemented an ongoing oral health monitoring scan program so that we were able to compare these um, sites readily and kind of, you know, solve this mystery that this patient was having. We can see the opposing arch, so tooth number 24 or tooth number 12. And again, we see that formation of a non carious class 5 lesion in a very short period of time. Now, what's significant about this patient is that she's in her late 20s. Um, you can tell she does have nicely aligned teeth. She does have a history of bruxism and TMJ type issues. And she is currently in a night guard. So, even patients that wear night guards perhaps are not protected from certain forms of parafunction that they can be um, participating in during the day perhaps and or just even normal function. So every time her teeth come together, which is you know 800 times a day when we swallow or having a meal, those forces are not being applied in the best possible way because they are going through that at non-working cusp versus being on the working cusp, which is more preferable. 
Okay, let's take a look at premature wearing of the enamel. Now, this study will actually tell us that the normal rate of tooth wear is estimated to be between one and 1.46 or one and a half millimeters of enamel loss for the maxillary and mandibular central incisors by the age of 70 years old. So technically, in a lifetime, we should never see any kind of dentin exposure on our incisor teeth. So think about that when you, you know, think of how many patients you saw today and perhaps started to see these lines start to develop. So as we go across these photographs, the 44-year-olds uh, are actually my teeth, uh, not recent, They're that's almost three years old now, but you can see that I have very minimal to no wear of my incisal edges. The patient next to me, you know, at that time was three years older, and, you know, I'd be pretty upset if I could go from the type of enamel that I have to having even that amount of wear in that short period of time. The surprising patient here is 35 years old, and then that last patient is 70 years young. So as we take a look across, you know, which patients am I worried the most about? Obviously, the severe wear is beyond some kind of easy repair, and to restore function, we're gonna have to do, you know, major type of restorative dentistry. But the patients I'm most worried about in terms of, you know, what, how long her teeth will last and, you know, how are we going to sustain any kind of dentistry is that 35-year-old because we're starting to really see a lot of that dentin exposure and loss of enamel volume. So how did these pieces fall together quite significantly? Well, when we took a look at the occlusal scans of these patients, you know, you look at my teeth, and what did I see? I saw, you know, those lighter contact areas, so areas of blues and, and greens, knowing that I didn't have heavy contact on those teeth. Now, if you look at my lower right lateral incisor, you can see that I have that island of orange, maybe a small speck of red there, and yet, interestingly enough, you may have noticed that's the one tooth that I have some significant recession on. I can promise you, as a dental hygienist for over two decades, I did not voluntarily brush that tooth harder than any other tooth in my arch to inflict that type of, of wound on my tissue. And as we move along, we can start to see this pattern evolve. So here's this patient at 47 years old, more wear, more contact on the anterior tooth. What about the 35 year old? So it really starts to unfold how the technology can start to put these pieces of the puzzle or you know, solve these mysteries as to why things might be deteriorating earlier and breaking down faster. Now, I don't have a scan for the 70-year-old. However, we can appreciate, as I mentioned before, that once we reach this amount of destruction, um, that it really is pretty complex dental work, pretty expensive dental treatment that's required to restore these patients to function. And when you think of what you want to be doing at 70 years old, I think we can all appreciate that it is not spending our time and, and uh, life savings in doing full mouth reconstruction. So the last topic we want to broach is um, receding gums and soft tissue challenges that we face. So we kind of looked at me a little bit earlier on, and I, I guess we like to take photographs of my teeth, but we can start to see the progression of, you know, what happened to that lateral central incisor of mine. Now, you can tell that over time I, I whitened, I stopped whitening, I whitened a little bit more. Uh, I do practice what I preach in the sense of, you know, my oral self-care habits are, you know, to do thorough brushings and, and uh, flossing. 
Uh, I usually don't have very many deposits, if any, around these lower anterior teeth. So my wonderful dental hygienist who cleans my teeth probably spends about three to four minutes, you know, scaling through these six teeth. So you think about your day and, you know, the time that we spend with our patients, how do we pick up on these things? How do we see those changes happening readily? And, you know, the types of documentation that we've been doing through the years, does it support us being able to detect and identify, you know, breakdown and deterioration as fast as we would like them to? Now, the interesting thing when it comes to gingival recession is that thought processes are also changing. So we would never in the past, if I think about even a decade ago, definitely two decades ago, we would never even consider orthodontic treatment for a periodontally involved patient. But now the accepted methodology is that we can provide orthodontic treatment on the ground of a deleterious effect of malocclusion and malpositioned teeth on the periodontal condition. So it justifies going through this treatment. So if we look at this patient on the, the left of your screen, we can tell that we have areas, especially on tooth number, um, well, our upper right canine, so that would be tooth number six or tooth number one, three, and yet, you know, when we think about what we've been taught about occlusion, this patient is in a perfect angled classification class one. But what we can also probably postulate from this photograph is that all of her occlusal pressures are resting on those non-working cusps versus the working cusps that we'd like them to be on. So perhaps that's what's driving this recession that we see. Does it make a difference? It certainly seems to be that way. So if we look at this particular case that was treated with clear aligner therapy, initially before we started the treatment, we can see that the occlusal loads are primarily positioned on those non-working cusps. And then through uprighting, some mild tipping, some rearrangement of the teeth, widening, correcting axial inclinations, we transfer that occlusion onto the ideal working cusp. And what the end result is, is we actually have some improvement with the soft tissue architecture. So we can see differences between teeth number, um, even the interdental soft tissue architecture between 1.3 and 1.4, 1.4 and 1.5, or for uh, my American colleagues, teeth number uh, six to five and five to four. What did it mean in terms of that occlusal mapping? Again, we can see how we're shifting that heavy load. So that intensity, that greater maximum intercuspation point uh, from those non-working cusps where the, marked by those red areas of the arrows, and then changing them in terms of their location, positioning them onto the working cusp, and then also alleviating those pressures so that the bite has more symmetry and there's better overall color distribution. So how does this all fit in in terms of what we do every day. When I take a look at what my typical day looks like for you know the last decade, it is a struggle to get everything that we want to get done within hopefully that one hour of time that we have with our patients or clients. But typically what that workflow looks like is I'm you know doing my initial evaluation, doing my initial assessment, I'm spending the majority of my time debriding teeth, getting the therapy done. And it feels like if I have a couple of minutes left at the end of the appointment, I'm going to try and get some education in there. So I came across this fantastic article. Now, it was written back in 2007 
published in Dental Economics, written by a fellow dental hygienist um, named Linda Drevenstedt. And this is really what she postulated would be the ideal way to enhance the value of the hygiene appointment. And I think it is something that if we strive towards, that it can make a world of difference. So yes, we definitely want to start off by doing our evaluation and assessment. But then being able to use that assessment in the moment, especially now with this new digital technology, we can bypass this kind of rushing the education at the end of the appointment, but instead introduce it before we get to our therapy. The reasoning behind this is that if we can educate our patients in a valuable way that they understand in the moment, then we can probably gear them towards better health. And in the long run, if we get them to the therapies that they truly need, then we will likely be spending less time providing the therapy. And to me, you know, if we can get our patients healthier, then we will require less neck hurting, back breaking, carpal tunnel inducing therapies that we have to offer day in and day out. So how are we going to do this? Because I know that is always the largest challenge. Um, you know, I have an hour, I have 45 minutes. How am I going to be able to integrate this into an appointment? Well, I kind of look at it as a technology swap. Now, I know most of us are going to have or have used and very routinely used an intraoral camera. And it was honestly the greatest piece of technology that was introduced to dentistry many years ago where we could finally, you know, look inside a patient's mouth and present them with some images that had some relevance. So we could point out tooth wear, we could point out erosion, recession, failing margins around restorations and deposits. However, now with a digital scan, we can cover all of those elements in one scan that we can, you know, with some proper training and some practice that you can, you know, get together in three minutes or less or five minutes or less, and then have all of that information available to you to present to your patient immediately in a form that they can visualize and recognize in terms of, you know, is it top tooth? Is it a bottom tooth? Is it on the right side? Is it on the left side? Is it on the tongue side? Versus, you know, these random images that we would collect with an intraoral camera and then try to make sense of, you know, oh, you know, this is, hold on a second, is this a mirrored image? Is this your left tooth or is the right tooth? So, you know, or, you know, the erosion, trying to kind of get a light in or have them hold a hand mirror so that they can associate where these areas were in the mouth. So visually, again, you know, that's very, a very powerful tool combined with the verbiage that we use and also the kinetics of patients being able to touch that screen and manipulate their models so that they can have a better understanding of what that looks like in their mouth. To take it to the next level, you know, we can put this occlusogram on or this bite mapping on and be able to point to those areas and offer that explanation of, yes, the enamel is spinning or wearing or chipping in this area. And it completely makes sense because there's too much pressure on these teeth. And then as time goes on, we're able to use that time-lapse technology where we overlay scans that were taken previously to the current scan that you've taken and be able to notice changes that are as small as five one hundredths of a millimeter. So if we look at this lower left molar and we're able to recognize this erosive pattern happening, you know, that opens the door to a whole other level of standard of care. And as Dr. Paul Homley would actually say, it opens the door to a whole other standard of caring. Because now it's not just about, you know, you have this wear facet on this tooth, but this is how much it's happened over a short period of time. 
And let's talk about where is this coming from? Because it's obviously acid. Is it coming from your diet? Is it coming from your stomach? Are there sleep issues? Is this the beginning of sleep apnea? So we really get into this whole body and whole mouth, whole life approach that we can offer our patients. So I don't want you to be intimidated by all of the new innovation and technology. At the end of the day, disruption is won by those who define value in business according to the problems that they solve, not by the products that they sell. And really innovation as we understand it is both about doing things, um, different things as well as it is about doing things differently. So I hope that we can embrace this new technology and you know, it is tough in the beginning to implement. We have to have the training to be able to get our scanning times. But once we accomplish that, it really opens up so many opportunities for us. And as we see in this you know, very particular case, what happened to the AAP classification for that patient? Well, it didn't change, but look at all of the positive things that we were able to achieve through having that education process, using the digital technology, this patient following through with clear aligner therapy. So we eliminated the risk for secondary occlusal trauma. We decreased the amount of attachment loss uh, through repositioning of uh, the soft tissue as a result of that clear aligner therapy, but her staging and grading remained the same. So we weren't able to change the, the bone level or the, the patterns that she had. However, when we look at this patient in the end, which patient do you feel better maintaining and which dentition is more sustainable for the rest of her life? So as dental hygienists, I really feel that incorporating intraoral digital scanning will help us to create healthy disease-free smiles. So that brings our presentation to um, a close for in terms of the actual presentation. And I will open up the floor to be able to take some questions. Okay, so one of the first questions I have is, how do you suggest we motivate our hygiene team to use a scanner looking for motivation techniques? Absolutely. You know, anytime we introduce something new in the, the practice, it is, it's hard because it, it requires a change. And, uh, you know, we all thrive on change ultimately. However, when it's imposed on you, it's not always quite welcomed. I, I think, if anything, the first place to start is to make sure that your hygienists are comfortable with the new technology. So we have to provide opportunities for great training. Uh, it, it should be something that we do set aside time with. And once they can see examples of benefits of how we become you know, better clinicians to have that type of information available to you readily, I think we can start to change um, how hygienists feel about integrating this technology into our practice. And, and really, I think one of the great places to start is that conversation of making that swap uh, with regards to timing and uh, between using that intraoral camera and then uh, changing it to the scanner. So the next question I have is, we have been integrating scans on all of our new patients. What do you feel is the best way to begin adding that in for existing patients. Scan any patient when we have extra time. So in order to make this a success, I, I always say you have to plan for it. So my recommendation in terms of integrating it for your everyday patients is to take a look at your schedule at the beginning of the day. And if you are in a general practice, definitely we will accommodate our doctor's schedules first. So for any restorative needs, we will schedule our scanner. Our scanner has its own column as a provider. So schedule for your restorative techniques, designate that scanner uh, for your new patient experiences, 
and then backfill into hygiene. So where's a good place to start? One patient perhaps in the morning, one patient in the afternoon. And it should be that patient that, you know, perhaps doesn't require a recall exam, doesn't require radiographs to be taken. Perhaps it's a straight ab uh, debridement appointment. So we can kind of accommodate the scan time to be able to also fit in that therapy. Uh, I'd also recommend to get the whole team involved. So I know with us hygienists, uh, if we can have the technology brought to us or you know set up into our operatories, it will be easier for us to implement, especially for you know getting that digital footprint for all of our existing patients. Okay, tough question. I like this one. How would you go about the scan if you only have 30 minutes for the appointment? That is really, really tough. So um, I have to think that this perhaps is an accelerated hygiene um, practice, perhaps where you're doing um, probably more of the debridement and I hope have some help with doing all of the other things that need to be done. Um, in that case, it will likely be, you'll need to find some other opportunity within your practice. So if there is a, a flex operato uh, operatory or having your patients come a few minutes earlier, stay a few minutes after their appointment, and then designating a, a dental assistant or a team member, um, depending on how it's mandated by your professional associations within whatever province, or state that you're in if they're allowed to scan to start to accumulate that. Um, the other conversation really is if you only have 30 minutes, then it's also a value conversation for your practice. Like, do you have to start to consider increasing that appointment time because of the benefits that it can bring in terms of not only patient care, patient experience that is so important now, but also the production that we bring into our practices from a clear aligner standpoint and also restorative treatments. Um, next question, how much time do you actually spend on the taking a scan then showing it to a patient at a recall visit? So for me, I would say I generally spend, spend somewhere between five to seven minutes. So. As I mentioned before, I've had a scanner. I've been very lucky to have uh, an iTero, uh, obviously different models, but now with the element, I can easily scan a patient in three minutes or less. That's pretty much my standard time. And I actually won't even send it up to the cloud. I'm able to bring up that occlusal gram uh, for the patients in the moment, and then I have that discussion there. Uh, so that's usually my, my go-to. I will um, scan the patient and then go to that occlusogram and use that as my main education piece. Uh, if I have a patient that I have several scans and I'm worried about gums that are, or tissue that's receding, or I see, or I worry about some wearing on the anterior teeth, perhaps instead of the occlusogram, I might pick up that time-lapse technology. Um, next question is, so with a new patient appointment, would you solely use the scanner without intraoral camera images? So in our practice, we really love to create a whole digital imprint for our patients. So in our new patient exams, we will do the traditional charting. Um, and in terms of visuals, we are taking digital photographs, we still use the intraoral camera, and we use a scan. So in, it, it's quite an experience. Our patients, our new patients are booked two hours. Um, that two hours is scheduled with a preventive or a preventive dental assistant or treatment coordinator so that we can collect the records. And then there's about half hour uh, doctor time. So that really just depends on how that 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 works in your practice. Um, our patients typically do leave feeling wowed. They feel that we have taken the most thorough look at their dentition than, than they've ever experienced um, in their lives before. And really that having that intraoral scan is something over and above that most of them have never experienced. So it really does add to that that wow factor. 
Okay, next question. Thank you, everybody. Like, there's tons of questions here. Um, there's a question here that will there be a way to review the webinar as I was delayed in joining the webinar due to clinic? Uh, Lisa, can you kind of just help us with a uh, response? Yes, we will have the replay available um, by tomorrow night on the Catapult Education website under the tab called CE Courses. You'll, it'll be the first program listed. Again, it'll be on catapulteducation.com by tomorrow evening. Um, I have a question that asks, how long do you see the dental hygienist appointment for incorporating a scan? I really feel that, you know, it's doable in an hour. We definitely, it's, it really goes back to um, it's something new. And whenever we have something new, it is uncomfortable and it is painful and it hurts to incorporate. But once we get through those growing pains and we can, you know, manage our day, um, certainly there are tools on there that are more useful to us than some of the things that we've been doing previously. So it's a little bit of a mind shift, but it is doable in that hour. Now, does that mean that you're going to scan every single patient uh, in every hour that you have in the day? Uh, no, because then you'll absolutely hate um, even the benefits of what you can get from these digital scans. You'll um, you'll hate kind of going to work knowing that you have that workload on you, but you will find the opportunity. You're going to know those patients that have higher risk. Um, you know, perhaps it's even a discussion of, you know, maybe we're not going to do it this time, but it is so important for this patient to have that perhaps if they don't live far away, they can pop in for a scan or we can schedule that and or we can add it to their next hygiene appointment and pending on if it works within your practice, perhaps we add on that 10 minutes at that next appointment so that we can accommodate getting that scan. Okay, um, next question. How often do you feel scans should be done on patients? I think it's wonderful to be able to have an annual scan. Um, one of the great things uh, that I recently learned, at least in the province of Ontario, is that our regulatory college is accepting a, an intraoral scan as long as it is um, science-driven and it's an accurately captured scan to actually replace charting recession. So that would be something that you want to check with all of your regulatory bodies. However, there is um, this kind of change happening even within our profession as these new technologies come in. And it's pretty exciting, too, because, you know, this is what this technology does for us now with these scans. Who knows what's down the road, you know, another year from now or two years from now. Um, I think time lapse in itself at this point is about five years old. We definitely didn't have it eight years ago when we initially got our scanner and we didn't have the vision to scan every patient eight years ago. We were you know, only scanning those patients that wanted to go into Invisalign therapy uh, and definitely for the crown and bridge, but we never had this sense of using it as an education tool. And, and really that's um, really coming forward as that additional gift over and above the other workflows that it provides for us. So uh, ideally, it would be lovely to um, have a scan annually uh, on a patient. In Canada, we have uh, an extra feature on our iTero scanners um, with the 5D, so we're able to look for interproximal decay. So perhaps that kind of works into our workflow here in Canada. Um, but that's not available quite yet in, in the States to you quite yet. Okay, next question. I am a hygienist and have 50-minute profi. I can scan in four minutes and also get x-rays completed. That is so fantastic. And I think, you know, I really want to congratulate you because I'm sure that did not come uh, easily, Kelly. And uh, it's a, a testament to you also in that um, I can really tell that if you're making that kind of effort and you're making it happen, 
that you really value what that technology is bringing to your appointment and to your ability to be able to do thorough assessments and provide um, uh, tremendous care for your patients. Next question, how do you educate a patient who recently was recommended to have a night guard or receive a night guard? So I, I never say that, you know, any one treatment recommendation is correct um, or incorrect. We can only make decisions sometimes based on the information that we have. So if that patient reported to us that, you know, they're aware of grinding or clenching their teeth or we've seen clinical signs of, of tooth wear, then it's not necessarily not necessarily a bad treatment. However, we can take the opportunity to be able to, you know, look at that occlusogram, look at that distribution of the bite. And um, can everybody, can you still hear me, Lisa? I'm just wondering if my ear pods yeah. have given out on me. We're still good? Wait, okay, I just yeah. heard a little, okay. Um, but you can always backtrack with this patient and, and review their occlusogram and, you know, point out areas that you're concerned with because, you know, the distribution of the bite isn't, you know, doesn't have good symmetry. And perhaps that's what's driving the grinding. Or, you know, there are areas where we have more intensity, like those anterior teeth, and we're seeing wearing on those teeth. So, you know, really, is that truly the grinding or the clenching, or is that just normally because of how the teeth come together? So a night guard isn't necessarily a wrong decision. It's a starting point. And the beauty of being in general practice is that we're on a journey with a lot of these patients for several years. So that journey, as we know, with every road can have many twists and turns. And what we knew perhaps six months ago or a year ago in recommending a night guard could look very different by the time they come in for their next appointment. How would you introduce a diagnostic scan to a longtime patient that does not express interest? Well, uh, of course we run into that as well in, in our practice and you know we have a full service practice. We start scanning kids as early as the age of uh, six. I even have a, I just want to see if I can do it. I have a four-year-old that I did an intraoral scan on. So the, the scanner head is not very large. Uh, but for those long-term patients, what I like to tell them is that we have this new piece of technology that very easily in a very short period of time gives us a lot of diagnostic information about their teeth, the condition of their teeth, the condition of their soft tissue, how their teeth fit together, so that we can really offer them the best oral health outcome as the years evolve. And I'm pretty sure regardless of how long you've had patients in your practice, the general consensus now is that everyone wants to keep their teeth for a lifetime. Uh, ideally, no one, you know, I, I don't think, I've, last time I checked, no one's in the hunt for having a partial denture or a full set of dentures. Uh, people would actually love, unless you're already missing a tooth, you know, if we can avoid having implants down the road, um, that would be fantastic too. So really the approach that we take is we want to be able to have the most amount of information that we can accumulate so that we can continue to create the best oral health outcome for them for their lifetime. And thank you everyone for the questions that keep on coming. I think we just have a few more. Uh, at what age do you recommend to start scanning at? Or should we just scan all patients to allow for monitoring and prevention purposes? Um, you know, this can be a practice philosophy. You can perhaps start uh, once you have a full permanent dentition, in our practice, uh, we actually use uh, early orthodontics in growing and young patients. So we will use the scan to uh, monitor growth uh, and changes that can happen with time. Uh, and really, to some degree, even when we scan uh, younger children that perhaps are in a, a mixed dentition 
Uh, again, we're using it as a, a carry screen tool, but it's also uh, patient communication. It's also patient experience. The parents love seeing their kids uh, involved in their dental appointment. Uh, it also takes the fear out of dentistry because, you know, kids grow up with technology in their everyday life. They, they just don't know life without it now. So to add that component to a dental, com uh, a dental appointment is uh, quite a fantastic experience for them. So it also works in part with some practice marketing as well. Um, I have uh, not so much a question, but it's um, another recommendation. So thank you for all my peers out there that are just giving extra suggestions. Uh, Kelly uh, has also said that she cleans and then she scans. And while the scan is processing, she'll polish the teeth. And the downloading gets done as I'm finished with polishing, and it's a great way to save time. So we have some added little tips and tricks in there. So the question is, can the new scanners detect carry? So it is uh, a feature that is uh, available on uh, the new 5G. And as I mentioned, uh, right now that's available in some markets, not quite yet in the United States. Okay, and then uh, another question. Sorry, if you covered the section already as I joined in later, do you use the time lapse to assess soft tissue, especially recession? Uh, absolutely. So I really, my focus with using that time lapse uh, technology is that uh, I really do focus on being able to catch receding gum tissue as early as possible. You know, a millimeter of soft tissue is worth its weight in diamonds or, or platinum, really. When you think of all of the things that we do in dentistry, I think soft tissue grafting is you know, not an appointment I'm ever wanting to race to. So whatever we can do to recognize any types of changes in soft tissue at the earliest point, I think is to our benefit uh, and to our patient's benefit. And really looking at, you know, tooth wear and especially erosion. Uh, so much of our senior population suffers from dry mouth, um, you know, we're definitely the hot topic in dentistry is all about airway and sleep apnea and uh, a lot of that we'll see in that fight or flight process that the digestive system can shut down and we'll have episodes of acid that come into the mouth. So if we're starting to see that happen on the posterior teeth, that's an early warning sign to us as well so that standard of caring is, you know, elevated in terms of what we can provide for our patients. So definitely time lapse for soft tissue um, uh, and any changes in hard, hard tissue, so any changes within the enamel. And, uh, you know, for our recall patients whom we've treated with clariliner therapy, then I definitely want to make sure, you know, they're wearing their retainers and we don't have any shifting or, or tooth movement that happens as well. So it helps us to stay on top of that also. Um, how can I get a copy of that perio grid? So uh, not hard to find. Basically, if you take a look or you Google the AAP uh, periodontist, uh, periodontal staging and grading, it won't be hard to find PDF copies uh, of that new system that we're implementing. Okay, in general, how much is this fee for a digital scan? Is there a billing code and do insurances cover the fee? Um, so this will vary, I'm sure, between all of our provinces and all of the states in terms of um, insurance coverage and different types of codes. There are uh, some codes that are now existing to cover an actual digital scan. Uh, I have also seen where practices have utilized uh, a diagnostic study model code as well. So just because our diagnostic model is not poured up in stone does not mean that it isn't diagnostic. It is just a three-dimensional digital uh, diagnostic study model. So those are some options that you can consider. In terms of the uh, pricing, that can um, vary as well. 
Um, and, you know, and that's also a decision. Is it something that you bill for in your practice or is it something that you do without charge in, in a way where you build the value proposition for your patients to always uh, agree to have having the scan and, you know, taking a look at the numbers in terms of when you do the scan, what is the acceptance level for the treatment that you're proposing? So are those patients that are scanned going ahead with clear aligner therapy more frequently than those that are not scanned? Are you doing more restorative work as a result of also taking the scan? So all of those things should be considered. And I think what might be our last question of the evening is, is the scanner able to measure recession if there is a class five restoration? So if a patient had uh, existing recession, let's say there was you know, two millimeters of clinical attachment loss, two millimeters of root surface that was exposed, um, you know, obviously the patient perhaps expressed some sensitivity and we thought that the best resolution for this area was to place a class five restoration. What it will do is you'll catch it in time lapse. So now that there has been a change uh, in that area, it will actually identify for you that a restoration has been placed. However, clinically for us, uh, at this point, we would still want to make a note that that clinical attachment level has changed. So we still do have that, you know, perhaps net loss of two millimeters regardless of if that restoration has been placed there. <laughs>